How's it going everyone? This is MindBlank, welcome back to my channel and this year AMD has had some massive hype surrounding their products and releases. The number one spot is obviously held by the initial Ryzen launch, while the second most hype product they've released so far is Vega. But the problem in general with hyping things too far is that it creates unrealistic expectations. So did Vega create too high hopes for us? Yes, it undoubtedly did. One thing that it did not do, for a small percentage of us at least, from what I've gathered, is create above warranted expectations. You've never seen me talk about Vega before today and this is because I am a patient man, most of the time at least, and know how to read through the marketing curtain, something I've gathered along the way in years of sales experience. Now now, don't jump the gun on what my own conclusions are about this card and this architecture. We'll get to that in due time, but first I want to talk about Vega as a concept. Wondershare's Video Converter Ultimate is a very fast video converter. Take your favorite holiday clips, apply effects and even edit them in a timeline before choosing from a wide list of video formats that will be encoded using fast GPU acceleration. Download videos from different websites, create DVDs and enjoy extras like VR video encode, a GIF maker or an ever handy screen recorder tool. Check out more by visiting the link in the description. While Vega might not be my favorite star, that would have to be VI Canis Majoris, and it doesn't make the list of the top 10 biggest stars as well, the Vega die is standing at a very satisfying number of 486 square millimeters. There's no sign of GCN anywhere when AMD talks about these cards, just the Vega architecture and next-gen compute units. I think this slide nicely sums up what Vega hides under its hood, although products rarely stay on paper only level and real life makes things a whole lot more complicated. Upon first looking, this is very similar to Fiji with 64 CUs, 4 compute engines and 16 ROPs. Not immediately obvious is that AMD has doubled the L2 cache to 4 megabytes from 2 megabytes, which is meant to help the ROPs out, something that was limiting Fiji quite a bit. The Infinity Fabric makes an appearance again, connecting the memory controllers and other blocks. It isn't linked with memory speed like on Ryzen, or anything else for that matter, so don't expect to affect it through software anytime soon. Vega counts no less than 12.5 billion transistors, manufactured by Global Foundries with their 14 nanometer LPP process. This alone tells you that temperatures will greatly affect how far this card will be able to clock. Let's run down on some major features of Vega. HBM2, high bandwidth memory, the second coming, rapid packed math, double rate FP16 math, HBCC or high bandwidth cache controller, meant to reduce memory requirements while also providing better minimum frame rates. We've also got an improved geometry engine, primitive shading and last but not least is the SBR or drawstream binning rasterizer aka tiled rasterization, a technology that brought massive gains to Maxwell compared to its Kepler predecessor. To be honest here, we have no idea how good some features like the SBR are currently running on Vega cards, but by judging by how raw the drivers still seem, my guess is that there's a ton of improvements to be made in the immediate future, and do not confuse this with fine wine. I want to wrap up this short and not exactly tech-laden Vega architecture presentation and point to the fact that Vega's number one target is the compute market. AMD has only one architecture that covers everything from deep learning, the pro market, compute, mining and finally gaming. Notice I left gaming at the end. Anyway, the RX Vega 64 I'm reviewing today is a power color reference card, of course, comes with 1496 stream processors that have a base clock of 1247 MHz and a boost clock of 1546 MHz. For anyone familiar with Polaris and AMD's reference coolers, it would have been quite obvious how this card will fare in regards to its advertised boost clock. The problem is that Polaris was a piece of cake to air quotes fix, just up the power target to 150% and enjoy a locked boost clock even on reference cards. Vega on the other hand is a whole nother animal. The problem is not the power draw, adding 50% more changes nothing. It's thermal limitations that get this car to show a very unstable core clock under load, most of the time located in the 1450 and lower area. And this is where I talk about making this thing faster than it is out of the box. Undervolting. This card has a hard cap of 85 Celsius on the core. When it reaches this temperature, it will lower its clock speed, obviously. 
we can make the car perform faster by either cooling it better or reducing its power draw and TDP through undervolting. The latter is what I've chosen. Don't mind the 1630 reported clock here, things are still messed up as far as reading goes. This roughly corresponds to the 1550MHz advertised boost clock. The die runs at 1.2V default V-core with around 1.15V during load. My particular Vega chip can do 1550 MHz out of the box frequency at 1030 mV, which is roughly translated to 1 volt during load. This, along with increased fan speed of 3000 RPM, a level that's not disturbing if gaming with a headset and certainly disturbing otherwise, translates to lower temperatures so the card can clock higher, reaching the advertised boost clock. I've managed to get a locked 1550 MHz with around 77 to 78 Celsius max during load just by dropping the score voltage. HBM overclocking is definitely better than on Fiji. I stopped at 1060 MHz from the stock 945 MHz. This adds additional heat and as you can see here HBM has a separate temperature sensor and keeping this temp in check is also very important since HBM tends to lower timings if it gets very hot and will also downclock the core, yes the core, if temperatures are really bad. Obviously lowering core voltage leads to lower power consumption and it's actually quite noticeable. It's not anywhere near to GTX 1080 levels, its main competitor, but I could run this card on a 550W quality PSU and have no qualms about it. Outside temperatures are at hot to the touch levels, especially near the exhaust area, VRM and the doublers. Obviously the undervolt helps with this as well, so it's a winner on all counts except increased noise. Anyway, my overclock is actually an undervolt, so you'll also see benchmarks of this card running at a locked 1550MHz core and 1060MHz HBM. For higher frequencies, I really need something else if I don't want a jet reactor in the room. I'm working on this, don't exactly know what and how, but you can bet I'll have a video on it. I tested RX Vega 64 on an i7-7700K clocked at 5.1GHz, I also used ultra settings and tested good old 1080p and ultra wide 3440 by 1440 as my high pixel count resolution. I thrown in an aftermarket GTX 1070 and 1080 and you can check their factory clocks and the graphs themselves. So we'll start off as always with Battlefield 1, a game that performs very good on Vega, even at stock, so no issues for 144Hz monitor owners. The undervolt overclock is not really showing anything spectacular here, I don't really know why, but it does look a lot better at 3440x1440 ultrawide, giving us a nice extra 7 frames, lower power draw, lower temps and sadly higher noise. FreeSync 1440p ultrawide users should be happy indeed with the Vega 64 card in Battlefield 1. Moving on, we've got Rise of the Tomb Raider, with Vega again not showing much of an improvement with the undervolt overclock and it's somewhere between the 1070 and 1080, although 1% lows are not bad. The situation does change rather drastically at ultrawide 1440p and even the stock Vega can keep up with the 1080 while the undervolt is ever so slightly pulling ahead. The Witcher 3 is still very demanding and I've tested here without Hairworks and HBAO. Despite this, even though the undervolt overclock managed a very nice boost compared to stock, it's still around 6% slower than the aftermarket 1080. Again, ultrawide 1440p turns things around and we've got an underclocked Vega at the top handing in very nice performance for 75Hz FreeSync panel users. I tested Doom with OpenGL on Nvidia cards and Vulkan on AMD, that's what best vendor API means at the top. It felt fair to use the API that performs best on each card. The undervolt Vega essentially nets a locked 200 FPS regardless here. At 1440p ultrawide I saw an absolutely massive 114 FPS 1% low from the pack leader, the undervolt overclock Vega. Neither of these cards should pose any problems at this resolution in Doom though. Deus Ex Mankind Divided runs on the same engine as Tomb Raider, but despite this Vega's all over this chart with a very nice 10% lead over the GTX 1080 for the undervolted Vega card. Naturally at 1440p things are still looking good even for the stock Vega 64 and at 50fps it should slot in the freezing range of most monitors sporting this resolution. Far Cry Primal looks good on the stock Vega, although the 1% frame rate is more than 10% bigger on the 1080. Again, the undervolt is not providing massive performance uplift here and the trend continues at 1440p ultrawide, but this time Vega's on top with almost 70 FPS, so again really nice for 3440 FreeSync ultrawide users. 
Ghost Recon Wildlands, on the other hand, shows the GTX 1080 on top. I want to mention that it's really not okay to have this level of performance on high-end cards like Vega and the 1080, and this is backed up by the results at 1440p, which show a rather small drop in performance for such a huge pixel count uplift. We still get the 1080 on top, but performance is lackluster in this title at this resolution regardless. Mass Effect Andromeda uses the same engine as Battlefield 1, Frostbite 3. In my benchmarking area, RX Vega hands in very nice performance, but I have to mention that other areas show the 1080 a little ahead of Vega. It's kind of a wash in the end, except at 1440p ultrawide, where the undervolted card is almost always above the 1080 and really close to the freezing sweet spot of most such monitors. The Division is a title that seems to really like Vega, handing in very nice performance even at 1080p. I was expecting more frames from the undervolted card, but the jump in performance is similar when we move to 1440p ultrawide. Vega's dominating here and like always we've got performance in the middle of the freezing sweet spot. Last but not least is Rainbow Six Siege with great performance for Vega regardless of the state it's in. 1080p provides extremely high FPS counts on all cards, so 144Hz users are covered regardless of the choice. 3440 by 1440 shows the underclocked Vega hitting a massive almost 100 FPS average, although the 1% lows are looking better on the GTX 1080 by a few FPS. Alright, let's put things into perspective like always. We've got the stock RX Vega versus the aftermarket GTX 1080 and 1920 by 1080 res. If it's not yet, it will become quite obvious how much Vega benefits from undervolting or just generally lowering temperatures and allowing higher clocks as a result. It essentially makes the card on par with an aftermarket GTX 1080 at this resolution. Now don't have high hopes from the aftermarket Vegas as I can guarantee you that they will also not have a locked boost, just like Polaris AIBs didn't at a much lower power draw. 3440 by 1440 shows bone stock Vega essentially on par with the aftermarket GTX 1080, which is great news for anyone wanting to jump to an awesome curved ultra-wide 3440 panel. But undervolting the card shows a pretty unexpected picture with Vega on top in 9 out of 10 titles. I find it extremely interesting how Vega can behave relative to the GTX 1080 depending on each person's use case. I mean, it can essentially be either this or completely turn things around 180 degrees and look like this. If you find it easier, I've also calculated the 10 game average FPS and relative performance to the GTX 1080. And as I was saying, at 1080p, stock Vega is around 95% the performance of its competitor and on par when running its advertised boost clocks. 3440 by 1440 is a little different, with the underclocked card being around 6% faster than the GTX 1080. This is great news for how new the architecture and drivers are and should give new hope for future optimizations. Alright, let's finish this. What do I think of the card? To be honest, I kinda like RX Vega 64. Call me crazy. It's hot, loud if reference, needs tweaking to reach its intended target, the GTX 1080, but AMD cards in general are not for the laid back among us. I've never owned an AMD card and I've owned lots of them since the ATI 8000 series almost 20 years ago that didn't require some sort of tweaking, adjustment or fix. It's part of the ride, part of the fun for me after all these years. I didn't expect any different from Vega, starting with the power draw, performance, tweaking required to get more of set performance, etc. It is rather late, I'll not argue here. There's massive price gouging by E and retailers worldwide, I'll also not argue here. Stocks are really bad, I'll agree, and the packs are poorly thought out. I mean, who pays an extra $100 for two free games? That doesn't even make any sense. But in the end, if you've banked on FreeSync with its lower cost and vastly richer panel options, then Vega is what we've been waiting for. I know I have. Alright guys and gals, we are at the end of this one and I can't wait to get my hands on a Vega 56 card and try out some undervolting action. But meanwhile, I wanna see your comments on this RX Vega 64 card that we reviewed here today. While you're at it, don't forget to check out my Twitter and Patreon pages linked in the description down below. And thank you for supporting this channel by subscribing. See you next time everybody, bye bye.